During the 1920s and 1930s, a Canadian dentist named Weston Price traveled the world to study 12 different near-disease-free indigenous communities spread around the world. These communities had very different diets, but they all consumed fermented foods on a daily basis. A lot of fermented foods contain healthy bacteria that improve our immune system, help us absorb vitamins more efficiently, protect us against harmful bacteria, they help us stay thin, prevent us from aging prematurely, and help us produce serotonin, a hormone that stabilizes our mood, feelings of well-being, and happiness. Healthy bacteria can also reduce the harmful effects of allergies and diseases such as type 2 diabetes and even AIDS. The point is, eat more fermented foods for better gut and overall health. Miso, a traditional Japanese seasoning produced by fermenting soybeans with salt and a type of fungus called koji, is an example of a fermented food that is loaded with healthy bacteria that is regularly consumed in Japan and in the island of Okinawa, and in the Greek island of Icaria, and in the Ogliastra region on the Italian island of Sardinia. People regularly eat sourdough bread, which is essentially fermented bread that is also loaded with healthy bacteria. Okinawa, Ogliastra, and Icaria are three very interesting places places because they are three of the five blue zones. For those who don't know, a blue zone is a region with a very high concentration of centenarians. And in the blue zone solution, Dan Buettner tells us about them so that we can change our lifestyles to be more like theirs and hopefully have longer and healthier lives. The five blue zones are Okinawa, Japan, the Greek island of Icaria, the Ogliastra region on the Italian island of Sardinia, Loma Linda, California, and the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. But in the longevity paradox, Dr. Stephen Gundry says that the Italian hamlets at Cherioli and the island of Catava in Papua New Guinea also have very high concentrations of centenarians, and they could also be considered blue zones. Blue zones or not, the point is that in these seven regions, people are, or at the very least, at some point in history they were living for a pretty long time. And it isn't because their healthcare is or was in any way superior to the healthcare of other places, no. These people are or were living longer because of their healthy lifestyles. And in this video, with the help of four books, The Blue Zone Solution by Dan Buettner, The Longevity Paradox by Stephen Gundry, The 4-Hour Body by Tim Ferriss, and Lifespan by David Sinclair, and a few other resources, I will help you understand why these people live so long, and with this information, you will be able to drastically improve your health, and hopefully, spend more quality time on this earth with your loved ones. A moment ago, I said that fermented foods are great for you because they are loaded with healthy bacteria that can improve your health. But be careful, not all fermented foods are equally healthy. For example, sourdough bread is definitely not the healthiest fermented food you could be eating. Wheat and other gluten-containing grains are terrible for you, and even though fermenting them can make them slightly healthier, fermented foods such as miso, sauerkraut, kimchi, Coconut yogurt and kombucha tea are much better choices, although to be honest, a lot of these fermented foods can still be problematic. Let me explain. Miso, which is made from soy, contains phytoestrogens, which mimic estrogen in the body and can disrupt thyroid function and cause both men and women to gain weight. Phytoestrogens can also lower a man's sex drive, and in some extreme cases, it can cause infertility in women. So if you are going to have miso, consume it in moderation. If you're going to consume coconut yogurt, make sure it's unsweetened. Added sugars are never healthy, but you will often see sugar on the label of unsweetened coconut yogurt, and believe it or not, this is not usually a problem. Because coconut meat contains no sugar, sugar is added to make coconut yogurt because the bacteria that make yogurt need sugars to ferment. The bacteria eat all the added sugars, meaning there is no sugar left in the yogurt by the time you eat it. If you instead want to have yogurt made from dairy, you should make sure of a couple of things. The yogurt must be unsweetened, it should come from a grass-fed animal, and it should be made from casein A2 milk. You've probably heard the saying, you are what you eat. Dr. Stephen Gundry says you are more than that. You are what your food ate, and this applies to the animal's milk as well. Factory farmed animals are fed grains and antibiotics, and this makes their meat, dairy, and eggs inflammatory. Grass-fed and pasture-raised animals, on the other hand, not only have better lives, but their meat, dairy, and eggs are healthier to consume as well. I also said that your yogurt or other dairy products should be made from casein A2 milk. You won't find this explicitly written on the label, but if your yogurt is made from sheep's milk, goat's milk, or buffalo milk, it's casein A2 milk, and it's safe to eat. If the yogurt comes from a cow from a southern European country such as France, Italy, or Switzerland, it's also casein A2 milk. 
that, and in those countries all cows are grass-fed, so don't worry if it doesn't say grass-fed on the label. If the yogurt comes from an American, Irish, or British cow, it's casein A1 milk, and it's best to avoid. Let's move on to kombucha, a fermented tea that can be healthy if it doesn't have too much sugar. If you're going to drink it, read the label and make sure it doesn't have a lot of sugar, otherwise, skip it. Natto, which is basically fermented soybeans, is another gut-friendly food that is regularly consumed in Japan. And besides being loaded with healthy bacteria, it's the food with the highest concentration of vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is a very important vitamin that works synergistically with vitamin D. Vitamin K2 helps keep your bones strong, and it removes the calcium that could be in your joints or arteries and puts it in your bones, where calcium is supposed to be. Like miso, natto is soy, so also consume it in moderation. With that said, sauerkraut and kimchi are pretty safe, so feel free to go crazy with those two. There is so much more you can do and eat to improve your health, but to keep this video relatively short, I will only be focusing on the Okinawan diet and lifestyle. I will tell you what they eat and do, and although I will talk about the other blue zones here and there, I won't explain them in depth. Unfortunately, the Okinawan diet changed and people are no longer living as long as they used to, so the Okinawan diet of today is not worth talking about, but the diet they used to have sure is, so that is the one I'm going to be talking about in this video. Back then when people were actually living long and healthy lives on the island, besides eating miso, they were also eating a lot of sweet potatoes, specifically purple sweet potatoes, turmeric, garlic, shiitake mushrooms, seaweed. They drank a lot of green tea, and they ate something called goya, or bitter melon. In a minute, I'll be talking about the amazing health benefits of these foods. But before I say anything else, I feel obligated to say that I am not a doctor, and I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just a guy who is passionate about nutrition, and I spend a great deal of my time reading about it and applying what I read. With that said, let's move on. If for whatever reason you're not going to eat fermented foods, consider probiotics. Probiotics are the healthy bacteria that you want in your gut. But taking probiotics or eating fermented foods is not enough. In The Longevity Paradox, Dr. Stephen Gundry explains it like this. A probiotic is a seed you plant in your gut garden. It's a good first step, but just like a seed won't flourish without water and fertilizer, probiotics won't thrive without prebiotic fiber or resistant starch. The naked mole rat is a fascinating rodent that feeds its healthy gut bacteria exactly what they want. Scientists are fascinated by it because this animal doesn't die of old age. They do eventually die, but when they do, it appears to be random and not because of their old age. They can live up to 15 times longer than other rodents their size, and they can survive without oxygen for a pretty long time. They also very rarely get cancer. Scientists are not exactly sure why these animals live so long, but some believe it's thanks to their healthy gut bacteria, also known as the gut microbiome. The microbiome refers to the different microbes that live on and inside one's body, and the food you eat is directly correlated with the health of your gut microbiome. If you eat prebiotic fiber or a resistant starch, for example, you feed your healthy bacteria, and your health improves. If you eat grains, you feed your bad microbes, and your health suffers, so choose wisely. Short-lived rodents do in fact eat grains, which are terrible for the gut microbiome. Naked mole rats, on the other hand, live in underground burrows and tunnels where they mainly eat roots, tubers, and bulbs. A lot of these foods are rich in prebiotic fiber or resistant starch. They are hard to digest, forcing the naked mole rats' gut microbes to put in the work to break them down, a process that extends the lives of these animals and probably the lives of humans too. Some healthy root vegetables include ginger, turmeric, Jerusalem artichokes, sweet potatoes, taro root, jicama, and beets. Healthy bulbs include garlic, onions, and leeks. I'll remind you that three of these foods are part of the healthy Okinawan diet. Sweet potatoes, specifically purple sweet potatoes, turmeric, and garlic. Dan Buettner says that two-thirds of Okinawan's calories used to come from purple sweet potatoes. Stephen Gundry says that it was closer to 85%. Regardless of who's right, the point is that healthy Okinawans ate a lot of purple sweet potatoes. This food is incredibly nutritious. In fact, Stephen Gundry says purple sweet potatoes are the best source of resistant starch there is. And in the Blue Zone solution, Dan Buettner says that purple sweet potatoes are one of the healthiest foods in the world. To get the most benefit from it, cool your sweet potatoes after cooking it. This makes it a better resistant starch, meaning that your body won't be able to digest its sugars and your healthy gut bacteria will love it. That being said, if you can't find purple sweet potatoes, know that orange sweet potatoes, jicama, and taro root are great resistant starches as well. 
In fact, taro root is enjoyed in the Nicoya Peninsula and in Catawba. Turmeric mimics calorie restriction and it's one of the most anti-inflammatory foods in the world. This is mostly thanks to its active compound, curcumin, which improves memory and attention span by reducing neuroinflammation. A randomized controlled trial showed that curcumin significantly improved memory in old people. The curcumin group had a 28% memory improvement, attention, and overall better brain function when compared to the group that was given a placebo. Another study showed that curcumin also had antidepressive effects in people with depression and if that's not convincing enough, other studies have shown curcumin to help prevent neurodegenerative diseases, to prevent a buildup of plaque in the heart, to promote healthy gut bacteria, to help with insulin resistance, and to help with joint pain. The problem with curcumin is that it has low bioavailability, meaning that the body has a hard time absorbing it and very little reaches the bloodstream. But its bioavailability can be increased significantly when it's consumed with fat or with a component of black pepper called piperine. Healthy Okinawans didn't consume much fat, but they did eat turmeric with black pepper, which can increase the absorption of curcumin by up to 2000%. In The 4-Hour Body, Tim Ferriss writes that a thin homeless man once approached his dad and out of the blue told him that the secret to losing weight is to eat garlic and then walked away. When garlic is crushed or chopped, a compound called allicin is produced and it has the ability to inhibit fat gain. The problem is that one would need to consume a lot of it to really lose weight, which is why Tim recommends supplementing with aged garlic extract with high allicin potential that includes allicin's precursor, s cysteine, which exhibits a neural bioavailability of almost 100%. That being said, garlic by itself is still a healthy food. It's a powerful natural medicine that is rich in prebiotic fiber and helps prevent a variety of diseases such as cancer, arthritis, atherosclerosis, and when combined with lemon juice, it can significantly lower triglycerides and LDL cholesterol. You might have noticed that I left white potatoes out of the list, and chances are you're wondering if that was on purpose. Well, it was because I don't know if they're healthy. In the Blue Zone Solution, Dan Buettner mentions that in Icaria, people eat potatoes almost daily, and they account for about 9% of their daily calorie intake. He also says they can help reduce blood pressure, lower inflammation, and surprisingly, even prevent diabetes. I say surprisingly because white potatoes have a bad reputation for having a high glycemic index and spiking blood sugar levels, which is definitely not good for diabetes. Having said that, in Lifespan, David Sinclair mentions that Dr. Rhonda Patrick told him that potatoes don't spike blood sugar levels that much. Dr. Stephen Gundry, on the other hand, says that white potatoes should be avoided as they are loaded with lectins and they feed unhealthy gut bacteria. Back to the naked mole rat. Besides eating roots, tubers, and bulbs, they also eat mushrooms, which are incredibly nutritious. One study showed that eating two cups of mushrooms a week can help reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease by up to 90%. They are rich in glutathione, a very powerful antioxidant, as well as polysaccharides, which are good for the microbiome and strengthen the immune system. They're also a great source of polyamines, which help protect the gut wall, lower inflammation, promote autophagy, and regulate brain function. Polyamines have been shown to extend the life of animals, but because high levels of polyamines are found among centenarians, they're likely to extend human life as well. Strange as it sounds, besides being found in mushrooms, one of the most powerful polyamines can also be found in semen, and it's called spermidine. Spermidine has been used to extend the life of different animals, and because it's found in semen, this might make some people wonder if a loss of semen can shorten lifespan. In the 4-hour body, Tim Ferriss says that it might. At the very least, male roundworms that procreate with female roundworms have shorter lives than males that don't. I'm not sure if this is due to a loss of spermidine, but it might be. Whatever the reason, it's something to think about because the genes and biochemical processes used by roundworms are the same as those used by humans. In other words, yes, frequent ejaculation might shorten your life. In the book Taoist Secrets of Love, Cultivating Male Sexual Energy, Mantok Chia also talks about the importance of retaining semen for energy and for longevity, but he goes as far as to say that if you do ejaculate, you should at the very least swallow your semen to conserve your energy and health. 
Anyways, back to mushrooms. Generally speaking, mushrooms are very good for one's health. Although mycologist Paul Stamets recommends cooking portobello mushrooms at very high temperatures to destroy the carcinogens that they naturally contain. But even if you do that, portobello and white button mushrooms are nowhere near as nutritious as medicinal mushrooms. There are hundreds of different species of them, but I will only be talking about a few of the most popular. But before I say anything else, I should say that medicinal mushrooms don't have psychedelic effects. They're not magic mushrooms, but they are magical in their own way, and they are legal everywhere in the world. The king of the medicinal mushrooms is known as chaga, and it contains anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. In fact, in Russia, a chaga mushroom extract called bee fungin is often used to treat some types of cancers to very good effect. The queen of the medicinal mushrooms is the reishi mushroom. It has been used for millennia in Asian countries like China and Japan as medicine. One study showed that taking reishi can lower depression and anxiety, but it's also good for improving sleep, regulating blood sugar, lowering inflammation, and apparently, it can even promote longevity. Having said that, neither chaga or reishi are edible mushrooms. They both have a very hard texture, so they have to be processed in order to be consumed. If you want to take either of these mushrooms, you'll have to buy them in capsules, powders, or tinctures. Lion's mane mushrooms are edible, and they are the ultimate brain food. They improve concentration, they have neurogenerative properties that can help with neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's. They improve memory, mood, cognitive function, creativity, and increase mental clarity. I don't know if enoki mushrooms are considered to be medicinal mushrooms, but they seem to have very powerful anti-cancer properties, so they sound very medicinal to me. Paul Stamets has said that in one region in Japan where they regularly eat enoki mushrooms, cancer rates are much lower than in the rest of the country. Finally, shiitake mushrooms. These are the medicinal mushrooms that are generally the cheapest and easiest to find. They're packed with anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and anti-tumor properties. They can help lower blood pressure and cholesterol, and they strengthen the immune system. In fact, in many Japanese hospitals, they use something called active hexose correlated compound that is derived from shiitake mushrooms to improve the immune system of chemotherapy patients. Wonderful as medicinal mushrooms are, if you're taking medications, be precautious and talk to your doctor before taking them. Also make sure that your mushrooms are organic and that they don't come from China. There's too much air pollution in China, and mushrooms can absorb a lot of it. Several studies have shown that Chinese mushrooms are often contaminated with heavy metals and pesticides. Bitter melon, or goya, is a powerful anti-diabetic. In fact, some studies show that this cucumber-looking thing might be as effective for lowering blood sugar levels as pharmaceuticals. This is important because having high blood sugar levels is extremely unhealthy. The higher they are, the more likely you are to develop diabetes. The good news is that if you don't have access to bitter melons or if you simply don't like them, there are other foods that can help you with this. In The 4-Hour Body, Tim Ferriss says that lemon juice, cinnamon, and fat can lower the glycemic index of meals and prevent blood sugar from spiking too much. This is a very good thing because the more a food causes your blood sugar to jump, in general, the fatter you will get, and the more likely you are to become a diabetic. But as I was saying, he says that 3 tablespoons of fresh squeezed lemon juice right before eating can lower blood sugar spikes by approximately 10%. In Icaria, people squeeze lemon juice on nearly everything, even water. This lowers the glycemic index of their meals and helps them control or prevent diabetes. Cinnamon, however, seems to be even better for lowering blood sugar spikes than lemon juice, even in small doses. According to Tim, cinnamon can lower the glycemic index of a meal by up to 29%. There are three different kinds of cinnamon. Cassia cinnamon, also known as ground cinnamon, Saigon cinnamon, also known as Vietnamese cinnamon, and Ceylon cinnamon, also known as true cinnamon. According to Tim, Saigon cinnamon is the most effective one for reducing blood sugar spikes, followed by Cassia cinnamon and then Ceylon cinnamon. But of the three, Ceylon cinnamon is the one with the best reputation. This is because it has the lowest cumarin content. Cumarin is a potent blood thinner that can damage the liver and the kidneys if consumed in excess, and both Saigon and Cassia cinnamon have a much higher cumarin content than Ceylon cinnamon, so one has to be careful. Feel free to consume them in moderation, but don't go crazy with those two. Let's move on to fat. 
According to Tim Ferriss, the more fat and the earlier in the meal, the less the glycemic response. Strangely enough, Okinawans don't consume much fat, which might make you believe that it's just not good for you. But in Icaria, Ogliastra, and Atrioli, olive oil is consumed regularly and in large amounts. And in Loma Linda, people consume plenty of nuts and avocados. Also, in a study conducted in Spain called the Predimit Trial, 7,447 people between the ages of 55 and 80 who were at high risk of developing heart disease, but with no heart disease at enrollment were divided into three groups. Two of the three groups had to follow a high-fat Mediterranean diet. One of these two groups had to consume a liter of olive oil a week. The other had to consume the same amount of calories that the other group consumed in olive oil, but in nuts. The control group had to follow a low-fat Mediterranean diet. After five years, the olive oil and the nut group not only had a significantly lower incidence of major cardiovascular events, but they also had better memory than before the study started. The low-fat group had worse cardiovascular health and worse memory, so eat plenty of fat. Healthy fats like nuts, avocados, and olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil is miraculous, so much that Stephen Gundry says that the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. It's a polyphenol-rich food that reduces the risk of heart attack, reduces inflammation, stimulates autophagy, increases neurogenesis, improves memory, improves gut health, and it reduces the risk of developing neurodegenerative diseases. Some people are allergic to nuts, but if you're not, you should know that nuts are great for the microbiome and the mitochondria. They put the body in a fasted-like state, something that can help it rid itself of cancer cells. In fact, nuts can prevent cancer in mice, and people who eat nuts regularly have a lot less cancer and a lower risk of death from any cause than those who don't. Even smokers are less likely to get lung cancer if they eat nuts. That being said, not all nuts are good for you. In fact, some nuts aren't nuts at all. Peanuts are legumes, and cashews are seeds, and Stephen Gundry recommends you don't eat them. Instead, opt for walnuts, pine nuts, macadamia nuts, Brazil nuts, pistachios, and even coconuts. Brazil nuts are rich in selenium, and just eating three or four a day can increase testosterone levels. Tim Ferriss eats three in the morning and three at night, and he likes to eat four Brazil nuts four hours before having sex. According to Stephen Gundry, pine nuts are great to reduce inflammation, but they can also help with weight loss, and some studies suggest that regularly eating pine nuts can promote longevity, so a daily handful will do you very good. Pistachios are the food with the highest melatonin content, a hormone that will not only help you sleep at night, but it's also good for the mitochondria. Lemon juice, cinnamon, and healthy fats aside, Tim Ferriss also suggests you eat slow to keep your blood sugar levels low. He recommends taking about 30 minutes to finish your meal. He likes to divide his plate into thirds and to wait 5 minutes between thirds. He also recommends chewing your food 20 times before swallowing it. Eating slow is something they actually do in Icaria. Icarians eat very slow, and usually with their family and friends. Drinking green tea like they do in Okinawa is a great habit because green tea contains compounds that are good for the heart, reduce inflammation, and protect you against cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, stroke, and mental decline. One of the beneficial compounds in green tea is EGCG. In The 4-Hour Body, Tim Ferriss mentions that EGCG is a powerful anti-aging flavanol that not only helps prevent cancer, but also reduces mitochondrial oxidative stress, helps you lose weight, and even helps sun damage skin skin heal itself. Okinawa, however, isn't the only blue zone that drinks tea. In Icaria, people use plenty of herbs to make tea, but the herb that is probably contributing to their longevity the most is rosemary. Rosemary contains rosemarinic acid and carnosic acid, both which are believed to promote longevity. In fact, in Echerioli, people use rosemary to flavor almost everything, and they often even chew it raw. Some even believe that rosemary is the reason why people live so long in Echerioli. Sardinians also drink a lot of tea, specifically milk thistle tea. They believe that milk thistle is good for cleansing the liver, and Stephen Gundry agrees. In The Longevity Paradox, he writes that milk thistle is something that activates the liver detoxification pathway. More on this later. One particularly interesting tea is puer tea, a fermented tea that not only improves gut health by promoting the growth of Acromancia mucinophila, gut bacteria that according to Stephen Gundry, may be the key to longevity, but also lowers iron levels. 
I first read about the health benefits of lowering iron levels in the 4-hour body, where Tim Ferriss explains that postmenopausal women have a similar incidence of heart attack to men. Once women reach menopause and stop bleeding as often, their iron levels go up. Bleeding lowers iron levels, which improves insulin sensitivity, decreases the risk of heart attack, and decreases the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And according to the New England Centenarian study conducted by Boston University School of Medicine, having low enough iron levels can slow down the aging process process and increase longevity. Also, researchers in Denmark and Sweden noticed that healthy individuals who donated blood frequently lived significantly longer than healthy individuals who didn't. In yet another study, researchers fed iron to roundworms and found that iron caused them to age more quickly and decrease their lifespan. I also want to mention that David Sinclair, who I'll remind you wrote the book Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, has said that he is afraid of iron because excess iron leads to senescence of cells, which is a very bad thing. I could go on, but I think I've made my point. Too much iron is terrible for your health. So drink pure air tea, and if you can, donate blood every couple of months. It's free, it's very good for you, and it could save someone else's life. I now want to talk about rice and tofu, both which are consumed regularly in Japan and also in Okinawa. I'll start with rice, which is an interesting one because Dan Buettner and Stephen Gundry contradict each other when it comes to rice consumption in Okinawa. In the Blue Zone Solution, Dan Buettner says that about 12% of Okinawa's daily calorie intake comes from rice, and one of Okinawa's top longevity foods is brown rice. He does briefly mention that white rice is also consumed in the Blue Zone, but he goes on to explain that brown rice is nutritionally superior for a couple of reasons. He says that brown rice contains more B vitamins as well as essential fatty acids. If you were told whole grains are healthy, or at the very least, healthier, this probably makes sense to you. But hold on a minute, because in The Longevity Paradox, Stephen Gundry says that in Okinawa, people eat very little rice, but the rice they do eat is white, not brown. According to him, white rice has a lower lectin content than brown rice, and it is therefore easier on the gut and better for one's health. So who should you listen to? I'll tell you what I think. Something tells me that healthy Okinawans consumed white rice and not brown rice. Or at the very least, most of the rice they consumed was white like in the rest of Japan and Asia. But because refined grains have a bad reputation in America, Dan Buettner probably didn't feel comfortable telling his readers to eat more of it, never mind calling white rice a longevity food. In the end, the average American consumes plenty of white rice and doesn't live that long. I don't think Buettner meant to deceive his readers, and I certainly don't think he meant to cause any harm. But like many American doctors and nutritionists, I think he's biased and thought that he would be doing his readers a major disservice by telling them to eat white rice. So he opted for its whole grain alternative that has a better reputation in the West. I think that's the case because that's not the only time when Buettner avoids talking positively about white rice in his book. In the chapter where he explains the Nikoyan diet, he says that black beans are one of Nikoya's top longevity foods, and he says that Nikoyans eat both black beans and white rice every day, but for some reason, black beans are the only longevity food of the two. As I said, I think Buettner is biased, or he might have been afraid of the criticism that inevitably comes when you say something like that. With that said, I don't know if I'd go as far as to call white rice a longevity food either, but when consumed appropriately and in moderation, like they do in Japan, white rice can be beneficial. If white rice is cooled after being cooked, it becomes a resistant starch, which as you already know, is something good for you. But to make it an even better resistant starch, cook it with coconut oil, then cool it, and then eat it. Or reheat it if you prefer to eat it hot. Although tofu is regularly consumed in many Asian countries, people consume very little of it in Okinawa. It's made from soy, and as you already know, it mimics estrogen and messes with your hormones. But the other problem with soy is that it's a bean, and beans are loaded with lectins. Because plants can't run away from their predators, they produce lectins to protect themselves. Lectins are in essence plant proteins that act as toxins. They bind to sugar, and they prevent the body from absorbing nutrients and they can kill your healthy gut bacteria. Thankfully, there are ways to remove lectins from certain foods. To remove lectins from beans, they must either be pressure cooked 
after fermented, which is why miso and natto are safe when it comes to that. In Loma Linda, California, people do consume plenty of soy, but Stephen Gundry, who happened to live and work in Loma Linda for a while, says that in the blue zone, people consume soybeans in the form of textured vegetable protein, which is pressure-cooked soy that contains no lectins. Legumes are consumed in moderation in all of the blue zones, so don't skip out on them, but remember to cook them properly to get the most health benefits from them and to reduce lectins. Let's move on to fruit, which quite frankly has a better reputation than it deserves. Of course, avocados, lemons, and olives are fruits, and they are perfectly safe and very nutritious. But these three are not usually the fruits that come to mind when one thinks of fruit. Most people associate them with vegetables. When most people think of fruit, they think of something sweet like an apple or a pear or bananas or grapes, which have some nutrients, but they are for the most part cancelled out by the high sugar content that is consumed alongside them. In fact, Rhonda Patrick told David Sinclair that grapes are one of the worst things you can eat, as they spike blood sugar levels dramatically. For those of you who aren't yet convinced, there are quite a few studies showing that fruit isn't all that healthy. Studies showing that fruit can cause cancer, dementia, and that it depletes the body's ATP, which is essential for life. I'll put links to these studies in the description. With all that said, this is a video about the blue zones, so what do they think about fruit and fructose? Back in the days when people were actually living long and healthy lives in Okinawa, they didn't eat much fruit. In the Greek island of Icaria, people eat apricots and peaches, as well as nightshades, but they eat them in the summer when they're in season. This is actually fine. According to Dr. Stephen Gundry, eating ripe in season fruit is not bad, as long as you do it in moderation. Icarians also drink red wine, which is made from fermented grapes. But this is also fine because when grapes are fermented into wine or balsamic vinegar, sugars are removed, which is why these two are safe to consume. In fact, they're not only only safe, they're rich in polyphenols and they can be great for you, but remember to only drink wine in moderation. Pears and cherries are the only two sweet fruits that are consumed in Sardinia, but fruit is only about 1% of their daily calorie intake. Although they also drink red wine, and they eat tomatoes, which is a nightshade, and it's a fruit. According to Stephen Gundry, nightshades such as tomatoes, bell peppers, and eggplants are terrible for you unless you cook them properly. The skin and the seeds of these foods are loaded with lectins, so you should peel and de-seed them. This is how tomatoes are traditionally used in Italy, but if you don't want to do that, you can instead pressure cook them like you would legumes. Pressure cooking nightshades will also remove the lectins. Loma Linda and Nicoya are the exceptions as they happen to consume fruit regularly, but let me explain. In Nicoya, about 9% of their calories come from fruits. They eat plenty of papayas and bananas, but here's the thing. When they're unripe, papayas and bananas and even mangoes are all great sources of resistant starch, and they are low in fructose. In the Blue Zone Solution, Dan Buettner writes that Nicoyans eat both unripe and ripe papayas regularly, and although he doesn't say if the bananas they eat are unripe, he does say that many of the bananas they eat don't sweeten as they ripen, so the bananas they eat in Nicoya might not contain that much fructose. As I already said, in Loma Linda, people also consume a decent amount of fruit. About 27% of their calories come from fruit, and about 33% of their calories come from vegetables, but they eat plenty of avocado avocados, and avocados are fruits, so it's unclear to me if these are part of the 27 or 33 percent. If avocados are part of the 27 percent as they should be, they might not be consuming that much fructose. But even if I'm wrong about this, you have to understand that there is room for mistakes, and even the blue zones make them. The people of the blue zones don't have such long and healthy lives because their diets are perfect, but rather because they are getting the most important things right. It's okay to cheat every now and then and still be a very healthy person and eating a little bit of fruit won't kill you. But if you're eating it out of season, just consider the possibility that it might not be the healthiest choice, and stop telling yourself you're doing something great for your body whenever you eat a fruit salad or you drink a fruit smoothie. In conclusion, avocados, olives, lemons, limes, green bananas, green papayas, and green mangoes are all safe. Nightshades are safe as long as they're peeled and de-seeded or pressure cooked, and sweet in-season fruits are allowed in moderation. With that said, if you want to follow these guidelines but you really can't live without sweet fruit, eat raspberries and blackberries in moderation, obviously. It would be better if you only eat them when they're in season, but at the very least, these two have a low sugar content when compared to other fruits, they're rich in prebiotic fiber and polyphenols, and they're packed with vitamins. So if you can't live without fruit, go for these two. Let's now move on to animal protein. 
Clearly, the Blue Zones have very different diets. In Loma Linda, people consume plenty of nuts and soy in the form of textured vegetable protein. Nicoyans eat plenty of corn tortillas, rice, and beans. In the three Mediterranean Blue Zones, people consume olive oil, red wine, legumes, and herbs. In Kitava, people consume plenty of coconuts and coconut oil as well as taro. In Okinawa, most of their calories used to come from purple sweet potatoes. As I said, these diets are nothing alike, except for the Mediterranean in blue zones, but one of the things they all have in common is that they all eat very little animal protein. This really shouldn't come as a surprise. Multiple studies have shown that heavily animal-based diets are correlated with higher incidence of cancer and heart disease. Also, according to Stephen Gundry, in Loma Linda, vegans are the ones who live the longest, followed by the lacto-ovo vegetarians, followed by the meat eaters. Eating little to no animal protein inhibits mTOR. When this happens, the body enters a state of autophagy, something that has proven to prolong the life of different organisms. In a state of autophagy, cells spend less energy dividing and instead recycle damaged cells. In other words, the body clears the junk out faster than it builds up, which is a very good thing. If you want an example of a country that does the opposite of the blue zones and instead eats a lot of animal products, especially red meat, take a look at Denmark. In the Little Book of Huga, Mike Viking briefly mentions that Danes love meat, and they eat a lot of it. I did my research, and apparently, he's right. Danes consume more meat than most other countries in Europe and the world. And despite them having one of the best healthcares in the world, a low poverty rate, low stress, and having one of the best qualities of life in the world, all of which contribute to longevity, Denmark's life expectancy is lower than that of the other Scandinavian countries and most other developed countries in Europe and the world. Don't get me wrong, the average Dane is expected to live longer than the average third world citizen and even longer than the average American. But for a country with so many positives, I would have expected them to have one of the highest life expectancies in the world, or at the very least, have a life expectancy as high as that of the other Nordic countries, but they don't. Denmark's life expectancy is lower than Sweden's, Norway's, Iceland's, and Finland's. And although I'm not sure if the problem is all the meat they're consuming, I suspect it might be. If you are going to eat animal protein, Stephen Gundry recommends eating small fish such as anchovies and sardines. Small fish are loaded with omega-3 fatty acids which have been shown to significantly lower total mortality. They help prevent Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, they increase blood flow to the brain, improve memory, improve learning, and even reduce depression. Also, people with high omega-3 levels have bigger brains. The problem with big fish is that they have a lower omega-3 fatty acid content and and they can cause mercury poisoning. And the bigger the fish, the higher the risk. Mercury is one of the most toxic heavy metals. It can cause depression, anxiety, memory loss, it can make it difficult to breathe and to stand straight, and it can even cause hallucinations. In the long run, mercury poisoning can cause Alzheimer's and heart disease. During the 17th century in France, hat makers suffered from mercury poisoning due to their chronic exposure to mercury from the hat making process. That's where the term mad as a hatter comes from. From. So if you eat big fish, take note of the following. Take a milk thistle supplement to activate your liver's detoxification pathway, as well as broken cell wall chlorella. Broken cell wall chlorella binds to mercury and other heavy metals, helping you detox. In the 4-hour body, Tim Ferriss mentions that alpha-lipoic acid has also been shown to help with mercury poisoning, so you may also want to take it every so often, as well as activated charcoal, as it can help you detox from other heavy metals you don't want in your body. But it's important to note that it can also bind to nutrients that you do want in your body, so don't take this one daily and definitely don't take it with vitamins and medications. Anyways, back to fish. If you eat a lot of fish and seafood, I recommend watching a Netflix documentary called Sea Spiracy. It's quite sad in my opinion, and quite a few sources have accused it of being scientifically inaccurate, but I still think it's worth checking out, as you'll learn a lot about the fishing industry and how overfishing could be affecting the planet. I'm not trying to convince you to never eat fish again, but it's important to be mindful of what you eat. And when it comes to eating fish and seafood and other animals, I think most people are for the most part unaware of how it all ends up in their plate. If you don't eat fish, or you're planning to stop, take an algae omega-3 supplement that contains both DHA and EPA. 
Consuming little to no animal protein is just one of the things the Blue Zones have in common. They also don't overeat, and some of them even fast from food entirely from time to time. They're physically active, and they live in tightly knit communities. Restricting calories is one of the best things you can do to improve your health and to live longer. Healthy Okinawans were constantly calorie restricted. They even had a saying that reminded them to stop eating once they were 80% full. Harahachibu. In an experiment conducted by the University of Wisconsin that lasted a very long time, they separated 76 Reese's monkeys into two groups. One group was allowed to eat as much food as they wanted, while the second group was fed 30% less food. Long story short, the monkeys of the second group lived on average two-thirds longer than the monkeys of the first group, but the monkeys of the second group never, or perhaps very very rarely, fully satisfied their hunger, so they were quite miserable. Calorie-restricted rodents also live longer, but they are very aggressive. Luckily, animal studies show that intermittent fasting works just as well as calorie restriction, and although it's not always pleasant, it's a lot easier to do because you get to satisfy your hunger for at least a short period of time. The residents of Ikeria are Greek Orthodox Christians that follow a religious calendar that calls for some manner of fasting almost half the year. The question is for how long one should fast every day. David Sinclair thinks that fasting for 16 hours a day is good enough, but more is definitely better. In The Longevity Paradox, Stephen Gundry recommends fasting for at least 18 hours a day. In The 4-Hour Body, Tim Ferriss recommends fasting for 19 hours a day, but some extremists such as Dr. Peter Attia only have one meal a day. In fact, Peter Attia used to do a one-week water fast every three months. I don't think he does this anymore although he does a three-day water fast once a month. Having said that, if you're new to fasting, start with shorter fasts. Don't just start eating one meal a day, and definitely don't do a three or a seven-day water fast at first. If you're not new to fasting but have never done a prolonged water fast before but you want to, definitely do your research on how to do it right and consult your doctor. Exercising and being physically active will also help you live longer, if it wasn't obvious. A study found that women who exercised regularly were less likely to develop Alzheimer's, and those who did eventually get the disease got it about 11 years later than women who didn't exercise. If you enjoy lifting weights or running, that's perfectly fine. Keep doing it. But walking might be the best exercise for longevity. In most parts of the world, there are five centenarian women for every centenarian man. But in the Ogliastra region in the island of Sardinia, the blue zone with the longest lived men, the ratio is one to one. Like the men and women from the other blue zones, they don't overeat, and they live in tightly knit communities. More on that in a minute. But one thing Sardinian men do a lot more of than the people from the other blue zones, and even Sardinian women, is walking. They walk long distances up and down steep hills almost every day in order to move the livestock from the mountains to the plains. Stephen Gundry has actually talked about this before. Apparently, walking up and down steep hills, in other words, hiking, is a very healthy thing to do. According to him, it will help you prolong your life, so do it as often as you can. You might not have the desire to live as long as the Sardinians, but most people want to be thin, and walking can help you with that too. In the book In Praise of Walking, Shane O'Mara mentions that the three most walkable cities in the United States, San Francisco, New York, and Boston, are the ones with the lowest obesity rates. If you're up for the challenge, do high-intensity interval training. Once or twice a week is enough, and according to David Sinclair, this is probably the best exercise for longevity. HIIT tricks the body into thinking you're in danger. You might be sprinting away from a lion or a tiger that is trying to eat you, and this stresses your body and activates the longevity genes. The other thing the Blue Zones have in common is that they live in tightly knit communities where people support each other, and funny enough, naked mole rats do too. Having strong friendships can help you feel supported, fight off depression, and stay motivated. It might not be obvious, but emotional well-being is extremely important for your physical health, so make it a priority. If you're very introverted and would rather not spend so much time with other people, at least get yourself a pet. Pets provide you with unconditional love and affection, and studies show that pet owners have better cardiovascular health, stronger immune systems, less depression, and longer lives. 
Prioritizing sleep is another very important thing you can do to improve your health and your everyday life. It's as important as fasting, exercising, and eating healthy food. And I was planning on making an entire video about it, but instead, I think I'll just quickly talk about it here. Getting sufficient quality sleep helps you live longer. It helps you stay thin. It helps prevent cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, stroke, heart disease and heart attacks, it strengthens your immune system, it improves your mood, improves your memory, it makes you more creative, and it makes you more physically attractive. In fact, in Icaria, people not only sleep enough during the night, they take naps during the day. And Matthew Walker, author of the book Why We Sleep, believes that this is one of the reasons why Icarians have such long and healthy lives. I will now give you a few tips to improve the quality of your sleep all coming from the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, including the weekends. Take a hot bath before going to bed. This will help you relax. Sleep in a dark and cold room. At night, avoid exercise, nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, big meals, large amounts of water, and blue light emitting devices such as your phone and your computer. For more information and details, read Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. One last time, I'll remind you that I am not a doctor or a dietitian, but I am very well educated on the subject, and after reading these four books on health and longevity, and a few others, as well as having listened to plenty of podcasts, and having watched plenty of interviews with health professionals, I am convinced that calorie restriction or fasting, a plant-based diet, exercising, getting enough sleep, Having good relationships and eating healthy foods are the most important things you need to stay healthy and live a long time. The last thing that I want to say before I end this video is that I am well aware that many of the foods that I talked about in this video are not the most common. Ceylon cinnamon, purple sweet potatoes, lion's mane mushrooms, enoki mushrooms, reishi mushrooms, natto, puer tea. These foods might be hard to find or very expensive where you live, so if you can't buy them, remember that cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens, and non-medicinal mushrooms are incredibly nutritious too. The reason why I didn't talk about them in this video is because no one wants to watch another video about the benefits of these boring old foods. But please, eat more of them, not less. So that's it. In this video I just shared with you a really big chunk of what I've learned about health and nutrition in the last couple of years. And I hope it helps you and a lot of people. But definitely educate yourself on the subject. Read the books I mentioned for even more information and details. And of course, when in doubt, always consult your doctor. As always, thank you so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Leave a like, and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time.